okay, afternoon. Uh, lecture four, GeoWeb architectures. So, uh, last week we covered basic web architectures, non-spatial architectures, uh, and this week we expand that basically to include how we do sp how we include uh, spatial functions, spatial processes into web architecture. So we're going to go through the technologies and standards of the GeoWeb, cover the GeoWeb architectures, look at how spatial data ops, how we tag, geotag spatial data on the web, how we exchange various bits of geographic data across the web, and then uh, two of the types of services, standards that exist, web map service, web feature service, then finish up with a sort of general discussion about mashups and the web 2.0. The first thing, let's see what we remembered from last week. So, what are, what is, or are, HTML? Who's going to give me, who's going to tell? Which is, what is hypertext markup language, what do we use it for? What do you mean you don't know? Come on. What do you, anybody else? What do you, what, what's HTML for? Web pages. Web pages, what about them? Sorry? Yeah, the web page content. You define web page content in HTML. So what's CSS? And you use them for? Styling the content, yes. What's PHP? Oh, go on, don't worry about looking it up. Well, PHP. Any guesses? Anybody? Personal hypertext processing. It's a language that runs on the server. It's a server-side language. Somebody puts in a, a, an HTML request or a HTTP request to a web server. It's often a, if it doesn't just return a web page, another HTML page, chances are it's running a PHP or some kind of server-side script that generates the web page to return. So what's JavaScript? Well, that's maybe, yes, maybe, yes. It's a programming language. Where does it run? Sorry? Sort of, yes. It runs in your browser. It's embedded within the HTML, and it's delivered as part of your web page and it allows interaction. That's what it does. It allows you basically to run a program within your web browser to interact with the various objects, HTML objects, once they've been loaded into the DOM. What's the DOM? Which isn't up there, I know. Into the, it reads the HTML document in it. It's called the document object model. Okay, so it's a sort of hierarchical structure that stores all your HTML tags and how they link together. What is an API? Yes, application programming interface. And what does it do? What do you do with an application programming interface? Quite an API is a publicly published interface onto a database. Application program is used also in other ways, just to, to describe a sort of program library. But it's a library that allows you to make web calls to a database to return data. And how is that data often returned? So you, you query an API, an API returns you some data, what formats might it be returned in? It could return a map, and we'll do it with that later, but we're talking just text here and just what we could call normal data, not spatial data. 
it gets returned as XML or JSON, JSON being Java script object notation. So XML and JSON are both standards for encoding data. And what you tend to do is you make a call from your web page or your web browser, maybe through JavaScript to an API, that queries a database, returns data, and that data is encoded either in XML or JSON formats. What is AJAX? <laughs> yes, and what does, that's what it, but what does it do? How does it work? XML AJAX, what it is, is calling an API from JavaScript to return data in XML or JSON without refreshing the entire web page. It's a short, so it's, a, it's firing off a request to an API for, through JavaScript and then requiring data to be returned in XML or JSON generally. So just to refresh, APIs and AJAX. APIs is an application programming interface onto a database. It's the way that you can query a data, one way you can query a database over the web using HTTP. It allows the client to request data from the database using a published syntax. The data is usually returned as XML or JSON, but it can be returned in any format you like. And it's called AJAX when it's called from an API is called from JavaScript. What does it look like? This is all revision from last week. This is what it looks like. We've got our web browser, makes an HTTP request to a web server, which returns some kind of HTML, CSS, runs a PHP program, maybe returns some JavaScript, maybe queries a database. Well, the arrows are going the wrong way there, but it returns the page to your web browser which may contain HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, may include stuff extracted from the database. And then, of course, that page itself may then call some other web server and do exactly the same thing, basically request a whole load of requests some data. Uh, the the uh, server does some kind of logic, accesses data from the database, and returns that data, which gets added into the page. Notice the arrows are going the wrong direction on the bottom left. -hand. So that's your basic diagram of how your web server works, where your, your, your web architecture works. So we're going to take that. Hopefully, you've now got that refreshed in your mind, and you've got a picture, rough picture, of how things work on the web. So now we're going to add, add in space now, or spatial data. So remember thin clients, thin cl thick clients. So a geo web application, all we're doing is sticking GIS basically into where we had oops. Oh dear. God. Hold on, control and let's start again. Control home. Sorry about this. This is jump to the end, right. Okay, so uh, so our application, our logic is now a GIS application. That's all we're doing. We've, we've, instead of just having generic database application, we've got a GIS application in there. Uh, and indeed, we could have processing either mostly on the server side or on the client side. So we can have a thick client or a thin client. Quite easy. Remember, thick and thin clients is about how much processing goes on the server versus goes on on the client. So it's just the same principle, but with spatial data. And of course, because we've got spatial data, we need special software to process that data. So that's your web architecture. Basically, you just stick in a web application as opposed to a, uh, a non-web application. But we'll go into the detail, a bit more of the detailed mechanics of it in, in a bit. But first of all, we're going to look at how data is encoded on the web and how space is, spatial information is encoded on the web. And a lot of data is essentially non-spatial. So it's photographs, web pages potentially, um, 
sounds, you know, you can think of any type of information that's been collected at some, some level of location in space, and you potentially want that spatial information attached to that object. And that's what geotagging is about. It's almost always about latitudes and longitudes, usually in WGS84, seems to be the universal standard. You, unlike, you're, you're rarely going to get a local coordinate system, but it's certainly possible, but most of it's that long. And most of it, if not all of it, is about point locations. It's not about lines and areas and more complex geometric uh, features. So basically, tagging, the whole principle, general principle of tagging, is the attachment of metadata to some kind of content on the web. That's what we say when we tag something. We tag an object, a resource on the, way, day, on the internet, with some kind of label. And if, then the geotagging is simply where those labels contain spatial data. It's a bit of a wild west out there. Standards are, do exist, but they tend to be, because it's covering lots of different types of data, the standards are, relate to a particular type of data, rather than there being one geotagging standard for all types of data. So it's no, there are no rules, except for the structure of the triplet, which varies by application. We'll see the triplets in a second, how this data is encoded. Um, but of, as we know, hopefully, that there are communities of users out there with shared conventions of doing things. So while you can do anything you like, most people, or a lot of people, tend to do things in a similar way so that they can enhance interoperability. So what are these triples? How, how is this thing? The data, this metadata, is encoded in what we call a machine tag, a, a triple. So what is a triple? And we're going to meet triples in another context, in the context of the semantic web later in the, in the later lecture. So a triple has the format of a namespace, followed by a colon, followed by the pre, a predicate, an equal sign, and a value. So the namespace is it's difficult to describe namespaces, but classes or facets or a sort of name of a dictionary, almost. I think that may, may be a good way to describe a namespace. We've, for those of you who've done data management manipulation, you've come across Python namespaces before. All names, all predicates within a namespace must be unique. So you define a namespace on the basis of a certain set of characteristics. So we might have a namespace called geo, which is all to do with geographic data. We might have a namespace called bio, which is all to do with biological data. So we can, so the, basically it's the container for the set of names, and it's usually connected with some kind of application area. The predicate is the attribute or property of that class, e.g. latitude or longitude. And the value is simply the value of that attribute. So here at the bottom we've got an example, the geo namespace, so we're using the geo namespace. The attribute or property is called lat, colon lat, and then we've set it equal to minus 34.53. So that is defining a latitude coordinate as a machine tag. And here's an example of a whole lot of other types of tags that are out there. So Flickr, the Flickr namespace, for example, has a user attribute which you can set to your username or your user ID. You could have a flora namespace with the attribute tree and the value coniferous. If we're talking about paintings and art, we perhaps have a medium namespace where the paint is equal to oil. The attribute paint is equal to oil. Geo quartier, here's three from the geo namespace. The quartier is a name string a name of a geographic location. We can also have latitude, as we can see, and longitude. So there are lots of different namespaces, lots of different tags, uh, lots of different uh, properties defined in each namespace. So let's see some real examples of geotagging. HTML. So an HTML page can be geotagged. What does that mean? Well, it's the... It's, these, in this case, specify where 
the pages are hosted. Not where, what location the pages are about, but where they are physically hosted, which may or may not be of any benefit to anyone whatsoever. So, for example, here, for an HTML page, in the, it's a, we can put this information as part of the meta tag. Remember, the meta tags go into the header part of the HTML page. So if we want to state this page is hosted at this geographic location, then we can do the name, set the name attribute here to geo.position, and the content we can set to latitude and longitude. As you can see, there's different ways we can effectively specify the same information. So in this case, we've got meta tag, name, geo, position. The, con the content is latitude, colon, longitude, and here we can see, so that's the sort of you know, the general syntax, and that's a specific example. Geoposition equals 49.2 semicolon minus 123.4. So that's giving us the geo coordinates of where the page is hosted. But we could also say it was hosted in London, Ontario, or we could use a, a, uh, an ISO country subdivision code. So there's a whole di lot of different ways that you can specify the geo geolocation of a web page. Notice these are used by the Bing search engine, but not Google. So Google doesn't care where you're hosting your page. So, so I can't think of a huge reason for those, but they might find useful. One of tags originated with Flickr. Flickr were the first company, the Flickr um, photo sharing company was the first one that developed machine tags and for geolocating photographs. So this is a bit more of a practical application. You've got a photograph, you want to state where that photograph was taken. A bit more, a bit more relevance than where a web page is hosted. JPEG images support embedded metadata um, in an image format called XMP, Exchangeable Image File Format. So this is metadata that's embedded within the JPEG image itself. So you don't have a separate file containing this information. This is actually encoded in the JPEG image. It's not visible on the picture. And for example, the XIF tool is a free tool that allows you to edit the metadata associated with images. Uh, and it'll do geotiffs, whole lots of different audio, uh, image, video file formats as well. And of course, once we've got your images geocoded, here's an online geotagging uh, application. Once you've got them, the EXIF is one tool. Uh, this is another one called GeoIMGR, which will ge you, can, you can use to online to geotag your photos. And once you've got them geotagged, of course, they can then be, if they're put onto a server somewhere and they're geotagged, so these are on the Flickr, Flickr map application. We've now got a coordinate for each of these photographs. Here's the one starred here, 350-year-old yew tree in Hampton Court, just over the river there. So we've got the geotags. As soon as we've got the geotags, then we can uh, write applications that read those geotags and display this information on a map. Very straightforward. Over the top. Um, well, I don't see why not. I mean, a raster is just a... So the question is, I have to repeat, the question, is could, could you use the same technology for a raster? Well, you could. You could put the centroid or the top left corner or the top right corner. I suppose you could because it's just an image. A raster is just an image file. Whether that's just the best way of doing it is another matter. But any... any yeah, I mean, I, I don't know whether, it's, for example, I don't know whether there's an application. I think the, one of the other applications for photographs puts like a little thumbnail of the photo over the dot and things like that. But, I mean, it's generally you wouldn't use this technology for doing rasters, which are slightly more complicated things, which are more correctly georeferenced to the landscape. I would guess, but that, it doesn't mean you can't do it. I've never done this. so. I okay, so that's geotagging images. But there's other things, there's lots of other things. And I'm not going to be comprehensive here over all the different objects that exist on the internet. Sorry? RSS feeds, yes. 
OK, so RSS feeds. So this is another type of thing that exists on the internet. RSS feeds, if you're from, you may or may not be familiar with these, these are rich site summaries. And what, these, what a RSS feed is, is a way of publishing information on the internet where the information is frequently being updated. So, uh, for example, a news feed would be a prime example. You've got news constantly coming into the news office. You want to release that information to the, to the general public. You can put that into an RSS feed, and then your users will be able to pick up that new news item relatively quickly. So basically, an RSS feed is text plus metadata or containing the information on the publisher, date, etc., etc. It is an XML document that's published on the web through an API. You can, and then you can use a RSS reader or aggregator program to subscribe to feeds. Your RSS reader or aggregator every half an hour or hour or minute or second will go and look at the RSS feed and will update its content on the basis of the changing uh, values in the field. So it peri your readers periodically check the fields. But just like with any API, you can type a URL into your web address and get the, the XML file up on screen. GeoRSS is simply a spatially enabled RSS feed. And there are two types, not that that matters in great detail. One is a simple version that only used WGS84 in latitude and longitude, as I said, for the Flickr images and things. Most geotagging, 95, 99% involves WGS84 in latitude and longitude. But there is an OGC GML equivalent, and we'll go into GML in, later in the lecture, which allows user-specified coordinate systems and more complex geometries. And these RSS fields are published by many different organizations. And here's an example of one, GDAX, which is the uh, Global Disaster Alert and Coordination System. So to dealing with uh, on, uh, world emergencies, earthquakes, things like that. So we'll see a number of these uh, throughout these lectures. And in this case, if we look here, we can subscribe to an RSS feed for disaster events. So if we want to get our aggregator, our RSS viewer, we can sign up and we can get those RSS feeds running into our system. You can also see here that you can also get this information in various other formats. You can see it on Google Maps. You can download a, GM, a, a GML file, sorry, a KML file, or <coughs> you can use another protocol that's similar to RSS called CAT, which is called Common Alerting Profi Protocol and is used, I understand, by various disaster and emergency relief organizations. I'm not familiar with it myself. But you can see, you can go to this site, you can subscribe to the feed that will give you the information that's displayed on the map above. And that's what it looks like. So if I go to GDAX, this is what, this is what the actual GORSS feed looks like. It's XML. We're not, we're not, we don't need to worry about the fine details of it. But we can see at the top, it starts off with an RSS, telling it's an RSS feed. We've got a whole load of what are called XML namespaces. So here it's referring, remember those namespaces? It's, giving us a, it's pointing to the web and telling us where the various namespaces mentioned in the RSS feed are defined. So they're using the geo namespace, the DC space, namespace right at the top. DC stands for Dublin Core. Dublin Core is the main metadata standard for all digital objects on the internet. Okay, Every metadata standard on the internet should be derived ultimately from Darwin Core. Sorry, Dublin Core. Dublin Core. It's called Dublin Core because it was put together in Dublin <laughs> originally. Anyway, so those are your namespaces, a whole set of about six or seven of them. And then we get some metadata tags after that. So we've, we start with our channel tag, tag indicating that's the start of our channel. 
our, our RSS channel. And we've got a title for it, the GDAX RSS information. We've got links, we've got descriptions, we've got who's in charge of it, who's the webmaster, what the publication depth, a whole load of metadata regarding the feed. After the metadata, we start to get the items within the feed. So each item comes within an item tag. We've just got the, the beginning of one of these items here displayed. We've got a title, orange earthquake alert, magnitude 4.5 uh, M, M, can't remember what M is, depth 19.3 within the Philippines, 2003. So we've got a description, a title, a description. We've got uh, some information on links to the website. And then important for us down here is down the bottom, highlighted in bold here. Here's the geo information. The geo namespace, colon, it's a point object within the geo namespace. And the latitude is 9.86 and the longitude is 123.99. Close it. Also notice that this, is, this information is repeated, but in a different format underneath. So here we've got the geo XML format for this point, and here we've got the geo RSS format for the same information. But because you've got people reading this feed who may be interested in the geo, prefer the geo version, and those who prefer the GeoRSS version, you publish both and then people can consume which one they want, rather than presenting it in one way and then requiring somebody to write code or something to translate it. So often you get repeated information in this feed so that they're provided in different formats that people find useful. So that's points, basically. Point tagging. But of course, we know ge geography, spatial data is much more than points. We have lines, polygons, networks, rasters, etc., etc., tins. And this is where the wonderful thing called geography markup language comes in. So remember, XML was used to encode data, tabular data. We had an example of our address database last week. Well, GML is just XML for geographic data. It's a standard uh, defined by OGC and ISO for storing geographic data in XML format. So it describes the geographical content, but not how they're pre presented or symbolized. And this was, to be honest, I'm not great on the history of this. I suspect this was, GML was developed in the early 80s by major GIS vendors. They agreed the standard. However, oops. Oh, here's an example. Uh, this is an example of a GML file. So GML point, we can see the different format for GML position list, 100, 200, so one coordinate for a point. We can see here a lime string is defined by a sequence of coordinate pairs within a position list, and a polygon is a slightly more complicated. We have ultra boundaries, we have linear rings, and we have coordinate lists embedded in that. We're not going to worry about the details about how you write. You can look these up on the internet. Uh, look how GML encodes polygons, encodes lines, encloses points. It can be used, GML is incredibly powerful and can be used to define topological networks and really complicated geometric data sets. So it's a complete representation, as far as I know, of geometric data sets, pretty much so, in GML. But, remember, they defined GML and then along came the upstart known as KML. KML is Keyhole Markup Language. Why is it called Keyhole Markup Language? It's because it was developed by Keyhole Inc., which was bought by Google in 2004. And it's another XML standard for geographic data. So it's like GML, but different. And it is, as we should all know, is the data format used in Google Earth, but also other Earth browsers as well. And it is now an OGC, I'm not sure whether it's an ISO standard as well, but it's now become an OGC, OGC standard. And KML took off, whereas GML didn't. And the simple reason was it was the format for Google Earth, and it was simpler. GML is very complicated, as you probably saw on the last slide. It's quite complicated to write polygons in GML. Uh, KML is not as complex. It can't model as complex data models. For example, networks, it's no good at. 
but it's, it's relatively simple for displaying points, lines, and polygons on maps. And also, very importantly, it also supported 3D data sets, which GML at the time did not. And because KML was accessible and usable on Google Earth, it developed a sort of wide user base with a long tail of users. Okay, so the long tail of users are the people like, well, so it's only me and you, people who go out, collect a little bit of data, want to make it accessible on the internet, want to make it visible. Not large, huge multinational corporations, national data collector and agencies. It was used by the long user tail of, long tail of users. KML, well, it's pretty much, if you can see that, Here's a KML file, very simple KML file that encodes uh, the location of a place. There we go. We've got a, a latitude. Oh, sorry. We've got a here, down here, we've got a, some coordinates for a point. Coordinates. And then up the top here, we've got the look at tags, which defines on Google Earth where you're looking from and to. OK, so you're looking at this location, which is actually the same location of the place from an elevation of 500,000, tilt of zero, heading of zero. So that's KML. And of course, just like we've got KML and JSON, there is something called GeoJSON, which is a geographic standard for data encoded in JSON format. I won't go into the details here, but you can look at this. In, but here we've got a, a point at the top. We've got a feature, we've got a line string here defined, and we've got a polygon defined here. Notice, for example, that it's perfectly valid to define a point, a line, and a polygon within the same GeoJSON file. That's no problem. Your ArcGIS might not like it like that, or other GIS might like it, but there's nothing to stop you doing that. So that's how data is encoded on the web. OK? So the question is, or the web encodings for spatial data, so how do we get and manipulate that data and use it in architecture? Well, unsurprisingly, we use, we set up, we can set up various GeoWeb services. And these are things on, or APIs on the web that support the return of various kinds of spatial data. So remember, the APIs that we looked at last week would return tabular data, basically. They might return an image, they might return something else. They can return something from the internet. So GeoWeb services report, return some kind of spatial data. And these might be maps as in image files. They may be vector features, set of vector features. They could be something else, like geocoded matches from a geocoding algorithm. Or perhaps you're sending a whole pile of images or news feeds and getting them geotagged as well. So they return some type of spatial data. And that spatial data, the spatial information, may be encoded as geo, some sort of geotagging embedded within an XML or a geojson file, if we're returning images, for example. But if it's more, but if it's from something like a spatial database or a shapefile, then we're talking about data being returned probably in geojson or GML or KML. Okay. So you've got your API onto your database. You're making a request. Generally, for a, for a, for a GeoWeb service, you're either returning an image map, a map as an image, or a set of vector features uh, within a encoded in GeoJSON or GML. And that's the kind of thing that the data gets returned to. So here we've got, this is again GDAX. Well, it's not actually. It's a, it's a European Union portal onto the same set of data. Here we've got the track of a typhoon in the Philippines. And this polygon, these polygons that define this, this, this uh, cyclone track have been returned as, as GML. Okay? So this application, the Joint Research Center, goes in queries the uh, information on the typhoon from the typhoon database and the spatial data that defines these, the, the, these, uh, the, the, these um, 
isolines of presumably intensity and probability are returned in GML and displayed in the web browser. So then we'll go into some of these standards uh, that allow these things to occur. OK, as we know, OGC web standards defined by the Open Geodata Consortium. And they, they define standards for the supply of mapping services over the internet. We'll look at map images and map features over, supplied over the internet. There are a whole load of other things that are also can be supplied, and there are other OGC standards, but I'm not going to go into those. And these, are, these map images or map features may be supported by many software products. So, for example, Map Server is a program that allows you to serve out both images and map features. It's an open source program. GeoServer, a similar ArcGIS server. So you can, these programs allow you to define APIs that will return map images and sets of map features on a request, on a web request. So, so the first one we'll look at is a, map, a web map service. So web map service is basically similar, if not the same, to Google or Bing Maps. You type an HTA, you type a web address. What, what Google and Bing Maps effectively does is send you an image of the location that you've made the request for. So that is an image file that shows the satellite image of the land surface, or an image file that shows the roads, or an image file that shows some other aspect of the map that they return. So it's an interface, an API interface, that de delivers maps as images, either as PNG, GIF, JPEG, TIFF, any standard image format. And it supports things like layer transparency and over laying of data. How does it work? Well, you send your, your GET request, your HTTP GET request, POST requests, from, from, the, from your browser to the server, a set of uh, a URL with a set of parameters, and the server will undertake the pro the map server will receive this HTTP request, look at the parameters and the request types, and decide what data to return to you. And it may be the request types are of two types. You can get, use the get capabilities type, which will return metadata about what in data is held on that web map server. So if you want to know what data a web map server can supply you, you can do a get, get capabilities request, which will return metadata that will tell you what you can do with that service. If you actually want a map, then you use the get map request type, and that returns an image according to the definition in the parameters. So here's a practical example. British Oceanographic Data Center runs a map server. So this is, I'm sorry about that, that's a bit low there, but there it is. There's that case of the uh, get map uh, function at the British Oceanographic Data Center. I, if I put this string into my browser, then I get an image returned, as we see here. And we can look at briefly at look at these parameters. Well, there's the address, address of the web map service. I'm putting in a get map request, and I'm ask, asking for a service, a web map service, with a bounding box set to those coordinates, set in the EPS G coordinate system 4226. So that's defining what map projection I want it returned in. We won't worry about the details of that right now. But it's saying return it in a particular map, map uh, projection. It's telling it I want it as a JPEG image, as opposed to a PNG image or a GIF image. And it's telling us how many pixels to make that image size. And that's what I get. I get a JPEG image returned into my browser. And you could change any of those, param those parameters, and you would get a changed image there. So you could zoom out, zoom in, move left a bit, move right a bit. OK, straightforward. So that's a web map server. That's all I'm going to tell you about them. 
you, stick, you set one up with those various parameters, standard parameters, and then you can make a query of that web map service. So web feature service is, um, is an OG standard for delivering spatial data. So we were delivering spatial data, but we were just delivering an image there, a map. We were effectively delivering a map. This will actually del deliver polygons, points, lines, polygons. Usually vector data, but it can be raster data as well. These are not restricted to vector data, it's just that they're mostly used for vector data. And it returns the data encoded in GML, geographic markup language. So it delivers data for client-side analysis or import into a desktop GIS. And it, WMS, WFS can be really sophisticated. For example, you can set up editing controls and addition, so you can add or edit data on the server through a WFS connection. So if you're mobile, you're on your mobile device, you're out collecting data, you find something wrong with the data on the server, if you've got the set permission set up correctly, you can actually edit that on your handheld device and then feed that by via the, w, the, the update back to the server by, via the WFS link. So you can build some really sophisticated implementations on that. Unlike the web map service, which just returns an image, you need some kind of data, some kind of, so, so for a web map service, all you need is some program that can read an image file, which many different things do. But for, for a web feature service, you need a client program that can consume a web feature service. And that may be a JavaScript program running within the browser, but equally maybe something, maybe an actual desktop GIS, it may be ArcGIS, it may be QGIS, so you may read, uh, read a web feature service directly into ArcGIS, for example. How does it work? Same thing, HTTP GET, post requests to the server, and we've got a number of various operators there, GET capabilities again to get metadata about what uh, services are supplied by, supported by the server, and then a whole load of things, get feature being the prime one for returning vector features. Won't go into the details of the other ones, probably don't know them anyway. Web feature service example, so here's an example, I've given the text, is tiny, you look at that off screen, it's not very exciting, but there is the WFS request at the top, and there's the response down there encoded in GML. This is made for machines to read, not humans. <laughs> you know, this is, this is not exactly, but you know, it gets, to, it helps to actually see and look at these things, but don't go, don't worry about the fine details. Of them. And indeed, that's our web feature service returned and then displayed into our, in, into our browser application. <coughs> so that's all I'm really going to say about web feature services and web, web app servers. We don't need to know any more than, about the fine details of what goes on under the hood. But this example here, and in other examples, are collating information from different locations. So in this case, we've got the track of a cyclone here, but we've also got information on earthquakes, floods, uh, cloud cover, and these are rainfall, and these have all come from different sources, different data suppliers. Some of it's come from uh, the uh, GDAX. We can see some of it's come from GDAX. Earthquakes has. Some of the flooding stuff's come from the GDAX. But we can see, for example, the rainfall has come from NASA, and tropical cyclones has come from the JRC. So different sources. And that is what we call mashing up data. Getting data from different locations, putting it together into a new configuration. And mashups can be of anything. They don't have to be of spatial data. They are basically dynamically created web pages or web applications that bring together contents or functions from different sites. For example, a distributed web map is an example of a mashup. And unsurprisingly, they're heavily reliant on people making data available. Otherwise, you can't gather. It's not so easy to gather data from multiple sources, so it's heavily reliant on public APIs to make data available. And it is part of what has been christened Web 2.0, which is a term you may have 
heard about. It was in a term that was coined at a 2004 conference run by O'Reilly Media and Media Live International. I, I imagine you're most you're familiar with O'Reilly. The public they publish large numbers of computer books, generally very good. Not quite sure who Media Live International are. And it's the term Web 2.0 is also linked with the concept of neo-geography, which is community efforts, uh, often involving the public, large data set creation, and the creation of large data sets by the public, uh, also known as volunteered geographical information. So I won't go into too much detail on that. So what are the types, some types of mashups? Well, as I say, mashups can be geographical, but they can also be of things like news feeds from multiple sources or numerous RSS feeds to a news mashup. You can make mashups of photos or videos. So we've seen the Flickr, but if you took Flickr and then took some other date photos from somewhere else and put them together, that would be a mashup uh, from using different photos and videos. Um, shopping sites, all these things go compare, which then compare at Parison sites. You go on one place and you say, find me the cheapest can of beans within 50 miles. It goes off and searches everybody's API to return the cheapest can of beans it can find within 50 miles. And of course, GIS mashups, spatial mashups. And spatial mashups are actually very popular. This is a pie chart showing from the programmable web that shows the proportion of mashups. The programmable web is a website where people can submit mashups. It's a kind of a, a directory of mashups online. And we can see that 34%, well, in, in 2010, 34% of the mashups uh, on the database programmable web were web map up, were, were spatial mashups. 10% uh, photos, 9% shopping. And it's only changed slightly since 2008. Uh, so it was 39%. So it's gone down very slightly. Uh, but you can see that spatial mashups are a considerable portion of the mashups that are, that are made. And indeed, here, it's well worth having a look here. You can search on the programmable web. You can search under category mapping. And it will return a whole list of several, I think there's a, about 1,500 or something like that returned of these different spatial mashups. How good they are and how what they actually contain behind them is another thing, but you can see that there's, it's a good place to sort of see the variety of stuff that's uh, published. Um, we'll ignore web scraping for the moment. So the web 2.0, so what is web 2.0? Well, it's the idea of the web as a kind of collective e-intelligence, which began, as I say, in the sort of early 90s. It's the idea of bottom-up, user-generated content, rather than stuff being supplied by government agencies, by large corporations and things like that. It's about people coming together and making things together. And the classic examples of Web2 technologies are blogs, wikis, YouTube, Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter, things you interact with. It's not things you just use, like you go to the Google search engine, you type in your search, you get your results back, but things you can actually contribute to. So you can post your tweets, you can post videos on YouTube, you can write blogs and share blogs and things like that. It's kind of related to the open source movement and sort of grew up together with it, with the SourceForge Collective and GitHub, which are um, coding repositories, places where you can share code. You can submit your, you write some computer code, you can upload it to GitHub, you can share it with other people. So it's related to that. It came along with a sort of same memes set of ideas together. Because it's not a rigid thing, it's not something that's defined from the top down, it tends to run on what we call folksonomies rather than rigid taxonomies. So rather than somebody standing there and saying, this is the standard, you shall use this standard, and you will lose your job if you don't use this standard, 
there are basically people say we're going to do it this way and then it's up to people individuals whether they're actually going to follow those sort of guidelines and things these taxonomies sort of build through time rather than being defined by some expert group so for example in a folksonomy there's no oh, you could have a list of tags a list of keywords associated with say an image uh, describing what it is uh, in a rigid standard, it would say you can put in this list of words, of viable words, for example. With a folksonomy, it just allows any user to define any tag or any that, that they would like. Um, Tim Berners-Lee views Web2 as a marketing speak. He is, uh, I'd advise you to, it's quite an interesting little uh, discussion there, but he basically thinks there's nothing new here compared with the web as he invented it in the early 90s but it's just a sort of way for people to sell things to people. But I think it, while well, that's um, true to a certain extent, it also, it's an, the, the, the interactivity that the Web2 technologies allowed certainly changed how people, people's relationship with the internet and data on the internet. And this is an example from the O'Reilly site, a list of sort of the comparable Web1 and Web2 Equivalents. Now, I don't know many of these actual these sites and things like this, but we, for example, we can all, we're all familiar with the difference, for example, between the Britannica or any sort of published encyclopedia and Wikipedia, which is put together by members of the public, whereas Britannica is put together by experts paid money to do so. It's a good example. But there's some other examples there of the differences between Web 1 and Web 2 approaches. And here's another slide. I won't go through this in any great detail. Uh, have a look at it in your own time. Uh, sort of, again, identifies some of the components of Web 2's uh, interactivity. Uh, we've seen this one already, the long tail. So dealing with the large numbers of users with small data sets, small, small demands compared with large companies. Hackability, the ability to get in and change stuff yourself. Uh, perpetual beta, can't say I'm a great fan of that, but the fact that never, nothing is ever finished, everything is always in change, code is always being updated and changing. Have a look at that. So, just to finish off, so what have we seen? Well, we've seen how to tag various data with geographical information, how to geotag data, JPEGs, GeoRSSs, and stuff like that. And we've seen how spatial data is exchanged across the World Wide Web through things like GeoSS, RSS feeds, web map services, and web features. We've seen that within the, and then finally had a brief look there at the at mashups and web to a sort of web two context. So the thing to remember is the technology is basically pretty much the same as for non-spatial, for the normal web. You've got data exchanged in XML or GeoJSON. You've got APIs, but they're spatial APIs as opposed to aspatial APIs. It's so the same technologies, but with just some other software running there to actually deal with the spatial, the spatial sides of it, the web map services. 